All right, in the last video, we kind of set this stage for what we'll be doing in 1.6, where we study descriptive statistics. Um, we didn't really do any descriptive statistics. Descriptive statistics is the process of analyzing data. So the uh, informally, the idea is you got a bunch of data from your sample, and you want to use that data to draw a conclusion about your population. But you just got a bunch of numbers. And yeah, I know there's not that many numbers here, and they're all organized, so maybe you can glean some information just by looking at them. But a more realistic case is you have a lot more than this and they're pages and pages in a spreadsheet and they're not organized at all. And you, there's no way to make sense of it just by kind of glancing at it. So what you need to do is summarize it. And that process of summarizing it is what's called descriptive statistics. And now that we know how to type these observations into a calculator, we can take advantage of some of the features of our calculator to do these descriptive statistics. So in this video, I'm going to talk about part one. In part one, we're getting numeric measures. So ways to summarize this data. Um, and we're going to learn three. I don't know if they'll, I think we'll just do the first one in this video. I'll keep them short. Um, if I asked you, like, summarize this data with a number, like one number that kind of represents the rest of these numbers, what comes to most people's mind is a measure of center. And you're like, what do you mean by a measure of center? Well, in this class, there's going to be three different measures of center. Uh, the mean, the median, and the mode. And what you'll see is two of those three are fairly important, the mean and the median. The mode, we don't really care a whole lot about, and I'll explain why. The mean, also known as the average, um, or the arithmetic mean, you get that just by adding up all these numbers and then dividing by how many you have. That's the calculation for the mean. It's not a bad idea to understand the calculation for the mean for some like theoretical applications later. But really, you won't be physically doing this. You'll be pressing a button on your calculator, and it'll spit out the mean. Um, but all the mean is is the average observation. And you get that by adding up all the observations and dividing by how many you have. And then there's the median. Some people refer to this as the middle. And the reason they refer to it as the middle is because what it is is physically the middle of your list if your list is organized from least to greatest, for example. So these are already organized from least to greatest. So all I have to do is physically find the observation in the middle. Let's see, there's 15 of them. So if I kind of started from both ends and worked my way towards the middle, I think what I'd find is the eighth observation lies right in the middle of these 15. Sort of this one's above it. I have seven below it and seven above it maybe is a way to think about it. Um, that'll end up being our median. And you're like, well, I'm not sure I caught all that. Don't worry about it. You're gonna be pressing a button on your calculator. It's gonna spit out the median. I just want you to understand how your calculator is figuring out the median so that you kind of understand some of the theory behind this because we'll not only want to calculate these numbers, we'll kind of want to explain why we have multiple measures of center, for example. One quick comment here that's not super relevant to this class. The reason we had an observation in the middle is because we had an odd number of observations. If you had an additional observation at the end here, if there was a 25, for example, well, then one observation wouldn't fall in the middle. Kind of both of these guys would kind of sort of fall in the middle. You might be like, what do you do in this case? Well, you don't do anything because your calculator does it for you. But what your calculator does is if you have an even number of observations, in which case there's kind of two different middle observations, your calculator just cites the average of those two as the median. So it adds these two up and divides by two. Five plus four is nine divided by two is four and a half. The median would have been four and a half if I had this additional observation here. However, I don't have that additional observation there. So the median, as we'll see in a minute, is just four. Finally, the last one is the mode. The mode is just the most frequent observation. So if you look at this, I have two ones and I have three twos and two threes, and I think one of each of the different the other observations. So I have three different twos. Twos show up more often than any other number in here. So the mode will end up being two in this case. There's more twos than anything else. That's my mode. And you might wonder, what if this two wasn't here? I, then I'd have two twos, but I'd also have two ones. I'd have two threes as well. Which one is the mode? What do you do in that case? Well, if you have ties, it turns out, they're all the mode. So I would have three different modes if this were my data set without this extra two right here. I would have what is called trimodal data. All of the ones that have the most would kind of win in a sense. Unless you only have one of every single number and then it kind of seems like they're all the mode because you have the most of all of them kind of. Um, what you end up doing in that case is you say you don't have a mode. It's kind of weird. To qualify as a mode, there has to be at least two of them. Um, and then what you do is you just figure out which one shows up the most and that is your mode. That's way more than I should ever talk about the mode because the mode really won't matter in this class. It's not that it's not meaningful. Sometimes it's nice to know which observation shows up the most. Sometimes that's useful analysis. 
But in this class, our data sets are gonna be pretty small because I don't want you typing hundreds of numbers into your calculator, so I'm gonna keep it pretty small. And when you have a small data set, like 15 observations like I have here, there's not really anything important about the mode. Often it's just dumb luck, the one that shows up more often than anything else. So we're not gonna really care about the mode. We're gonna focus on these top two, the mean and the median. And what I wanna show you is how you can get those straight out of your calculator. And hopefully you already have some, a little bit of intuitive idea about how your calculator is doing these calculations. So the way you do this is it's under the stat menu. You've already been under the stat menu. You've been under the edit column in the stat menu. That's how you typed your observations into a list. You don't have to go in there. I'm just gonna show you that under the edit column, I have all these observations. So if you haven't already typed these into a list and you wanna follow along, put these observations into a list. If you're not sure how to do that, watch the last video entitled putting observations into a list or something like that. But anyways, what you wanna do is hit the stat key and be in this menu and not go under edit. You want your calculator to calculate the mean and the median for you. So what you're gonna do is go over here to calculate. And your calculator can do lots of different calculations for you. We'll see several of these in this class. But the only one you'll use in this chapter is the first one listed called one variable statistics. And if you hit enter on one variable statistics, one of two different things will happen for you here. If you have a fancy version of the calculator like I have here, it will, when you're using functions, sometimes ask you for the inputs for that function. So if I want my calculator to do one variable statistics, I gotta tell my calculator where my data is. My data is in L1, you might have put yours in a different list, but mine's in L1, so I'm gonna tell it my data is in L1. Note that if, there we go, if you had an older calculator and you put all your data into lists, um, I'm not even gonna bother with it. You went over to calculate here and one variable statistics, it wouldn't take you to this screen. It's a less user-friendly input. If you have this version of the calculator, it's the same thing. You still have to tell it the same thing, what list your data is in. It's just you're not prompted for what list your data is in. So you have to know what your calculator is waiting for every time you use one of these functions. The good news is we're gonna use function, we're not gonna use that many different functions and we'll use them enough that you'll start to just remember, oh, it's waiting for this, it's waiting for this. If you had this version, you would just tell your calculator that I wanna do one variable statistics on the list L1, which you get by hitting second and then one, and then when you hit enter, it'll do one variable statistics for you. I don't wanna do that um, because I haven't put my data into a list over here, right? I didn't type in any observations, so if I tried to have it do one variable statistics on an empty list, it would give me an error. So maybe I'll demonstrate what the output would have looked like on this calculator over here. Uh, tell it what list my data is in. Something else you can do that we will never, ever, ever do in this class is give your calculator another list, like L2 or L3, that's your frequency list. So we're never gonna do this in this class, so you're probably not too worried about it, but just FYI, a lot of the calculator functions you use will give you the option to have a frequency list. All that means is, imagine I had 1,000 observations instead of 15. Rather than type them all in individually, I could tell my calculator there's 23 ones and there's 59 twos and there's 86 threes. The way you tell your calculator the frequency of all the different observations is with the frequency list. But we'll never have enough observations to make that worthwhile, so we'll never ever do that. You can always leave that blank or whatever the default is on your calculator. For some of them, it's a yes, no thing. Most of it, you just leave it blank. You go down here to calculate. It's gonna do one variable statistics on this list L1. If you hit enter, you'll get an output screen like this, regardless of whether you're using the older calculator or this calculator should look something like this. There's a lot of things that it tells you here, and we're gonna come back and use most of these in this chapter. But for this video, I only wanna talk about a couple of them. The first one I wanna talk about, this first thing listed here, it's a little X with a bar up on the top of it. The way you say this, not surprisingly, is X bar. Easy to remember. But what you need to know, what's Arguably the most important thing in this entire video is this symbol represents your sample average. And we're gonna be using that symbol a lot in this class and you're gonna to wanna to be really comfortable with that because early on, maybe I just tell you the sample average or ask you to calculate the sample average, but later on, it'll be nice if I can say, what's X bar? Or I can give you a formula that involves X bar and you know how to use it, what that all means. So X bar is always your sample average. It's the number that you would have gotten if you added up all of these and divided by 15, the number of observations I have. And that looks like it's this number, 6.0666667. Um, typically I tell you to round, I don't know, maybe round to two decimal places, you would say it's 6.07. Because to round to two decimal places, you come out here to two decimal places, 
and then you look one spot to the right of that. So I'm focusing on this six here, and then I look one spot to the right. And if that number one spot to the right is five or larger, then I, I increase this by one, so it's 6.07. If this number were four or less, pretend it's at 6.064, then I would round it to 6.06, not 6.07. Rounding, not a big deal. I don't care too much as far as quizzes go, but on the homework, sometimes it's a little bit more precise, so be aware of that. Um, the median, sorry, the mean in this example is this 6.07. Uh, a couple other things I want to hit on quickly. This is a Greek letter sigma. It's a capital sigma. Sigma X just means if you added up all these observations, you would have gotten 91. You can check that if you want. Uh, why do I care about that? That is sometimes referred to as a checksum. C-H-E-L, write it. And so what I typically do is I don't want you to enter the numbers wrong, like accidentally put in a 13 instead of a 3 here or something, and then all your answers are off when you're taking a quiz or something like that. So what I typically do is I give you a checksum. So if this were a problem on a quiz, I'd give you all this data, and then maybe I would say checksum 91. And then when you're going through your quiz, you can go to one variable statistics and look at this row. And if you see a 91 here, you're feeling better about entering all this data in. You probably entered it in correctly. You enter, entered it in correctly, not incorrectly, um, because the sum matches the checksum. So just FYI, that's what this means. These will be things you won't have to worry about in this class. This sigma x squared just means if you added up the square of all these numbers, that's useful for calculations we won't be doing in this class. The next two are things we'll get into in the next video, so I want to talk about those now. The next one, n, is surprisingly useful. This tells you the number of observations you have, so it's 15 in this case. Um, you don't cite that anywhere in this problem. You don't use that at all, but that's another one of those symbols that will be really useful to know. Just like x bar is the sample average, n will always be your number of observations. And I know it sounds kind of weird, but arguably the most important thing to get out of these videos now is these little bits of knowledge that will benefit you going on in the class. So later on, you'll see formulas with n in it, n will always represent the number of observations you have in your sample. So in this case, 15. You might be like, that's everything, right? No, because of this little arrow here. What this is telling you is that there's more output if you scroll down. If you hit the down arrow key a few times, you'll see more stuff. And these remaining things that it tells you, we'll talk about in this section all of these guys. Some of them you might already be familiar with. The only one I want to talk about right now is MED. You might guess that that stands for the median. It does. They're saying it's four, which is exactly what we thought it was going to end up being. Uh, the median in this case would be four. There's no agreed upon symbol for what the median is. Um, some books use a capital M. Some use a lowercase m. Some differentiate between sample and population. Your calculator writes MED. Um, it won't matter too much in this class what symbol you use. You can write out the word median or MED or whatever. The point is just if you calculate the median, it would be 4. The last comment I want to make before I end this video is note that 6.07 is not the same as 4. Right? The sample average and the median are different. And I guess both of those are different than the mode, which was just 2. So you might wonder, like, which one of these is the measure of center? Well, they're all different measures of center. In this class, we'll focus on the mean and the median, the 4 and the 6.07. And in a couple of sections, once we learn a little bit more about data, we'll understand why we have these two different measures and why you might prefer one to the other. In fact, I'm going to hit on that a tiny bit now before I end this video. Um, why two different measures? The way to think about it is outliers. And I know we haven't defined the word outlier yet. But we will define it in this class. An outlier informally is just an observation that's way different than the rest of them. Pretend this last observation here was 233 instead of 23. What does that mean? I mean, maybe I just typed it in wrong. Maybe I hit the 3 twice by accident and it was supposed to be a 23. Or maybe it really was 233. Maybe this is some senior citizen that's crazy active and she ran some ultra marathon that day or something. I don't know. I mean, it's kind of a ridiculous situation. But whatever. I don't know whether this observation should be part of my list or not. At a minimum, we say it's certainly going to affect these calculations, right? Imagine if you calculate the mean. And I know you're doing these on your calculator, but the way you do that is adding up all these observations and dividing by how many you have. If you added up all these observations and the last thing you added into that sum was 233 instead of 23, imagine how big that's going to make that sum. That's going to be way bigger. And then when you divide by 15, you're going to get a much different mean. 
right? Instead of the mean being 6.07, maybe it's, I don't know, 26.07 or something like that. Who knows where it would end up being? Calculate if you're interested. It's going to be way, 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 way different. The point is the sample average, aka the mean, gets affected by outliers. It really changes if you have outliers in there. The median, however, does not. Because think about that. The median is just the one that's physically in the middle of my list. If this were 233 versus 23, median don't care, right? I'm still going to organize these. They still would have been in the exact same order in this instance. And the one that's in the middle is still going to be in the middle, right? And I guess you could argue, what if the outlier were this one? What if this three turned into a 33? That would go at the bottom of my list. Okay, the median might get slightly changed if you include an outlier, but very little. What we say is the median... Um, I don't know, maybe this should be in a different color. Important fact, the median is resistant to outliers. Oh, that seems like a positive thing, like the way I'm kind of wording it seems like a feature that you would want. Well, yes and no. I mean, the fact that this is 233 instead of 23 gives me a different data set. Do I want my median to stay the same? Do I want this super ridiculously active senior citizen to not really have any effect on the number I'm using to summarize this sample data? I mean, I don't know. It sort of depends. What you'll see in this class are outliers are things that we have to treat really, really carefully. And how you treat them, well, we'll get into that more as the class goes on. But for now, I just want to make the point that the mean gets affected by outliers and the median does not. A defining characteristic of the median is it's the measure of center that is resistant to outliers, that is not affected very much by outliers. And that'll be fairly important going forward. But for today, I think I want to just call that good. Um, we have two measures of center. You can get them straight out of your calculator, the mean and the median. The mode is the third one, which you shouldn't expect to ever be tested on in this class. But I think it pops up in the homework once or twice, so I want to mention it. But that's all I got for measures of center.